we've heard that Russians are talking about non-strategic nuclear weapons and Navy getting prepared. On the other side, we've seen that David Cameron in the United Kingdom was talking about getting involved in the war in Ukraine. Macron as well. We have a CDU member of Bundestag. He's talking about Romania and Poland, backed by NATO air defense, could start shooting down air targets over Western Ukraine. How do you see the risk of having a direct confrontation? Are we going to have some sort of nuclear weapons involved? Well, the the the, the problem is that a lot of these ideas, for instance, this idea of shooting down airplane from Romania and Poland is not new. It was mentioned uh, early uh, in the war um, by by some some uh, poli uh, Western politicians. I I don't remember which country uh, uh, said that. So this idea that came to the a German parliament is in fact an idea that was already in the air. But <clears throat> the problem with that is that if, and and Russia made very clear that it's, if its territory is uh, uh, touched by Western weapons, and probably even was, uh, if the, the Russian ter uh, territory was targeted by British expert soldiers, whatever you call them, or French, or fired from Poland, then the uh, Russia would uh, would respond and will destroy these positions. But Russia is aware that if it respond to destroy, uh, let's say, a Patriot battery somewhere in Poland or in Romania, meaning attacking a military objective within the borders of NATO, it may, it may trigger a nuclear response. And that's the reason why Russia announced its drill for uh, nuclear weapons, because it's, it's, a sig it's signaling to the West we are ready to that for that possibility. That's the reason of 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 the the training, of training these uh, these guys uh, uh, for uh, with nuclear weapons, because it's 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 a way to make the um, uh, the, the 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 response the Russian response credible, because they say. If you do that, and, and remember that after David Cameron uh, said that British weapons could be used by the Ukrainians against targets within the Russian territory, that means civilian ter uh, uh, targets, by the way, because the war happens in Ukraine, meaning that the Russian military is in Ukraine. If you start to uh, target uh, as the Ukrainians have done, for instance, in Belgorod, they target civilian targets. So that's that's important also to understand from a Russian standpoint. And <clears throat> that means that after David Cameron said that, and after you had this idea of um, Macron for deploying troops in um, in Ukraine, the uh, the Russian uh, foreign ministry summoned the two ambassadors, uh, the British and the French one, uh, to tell them that this would then, if 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 it we come to that point, then Russia would respond, and the um, the the for the um, the British, uh, the Russians said that they would be there would be no problem for them to respond on objectives that are not even in, in Ukraine or in the area of Ukraine. So they may respond anywhere in the world. But they know that by saying so, they may have, or they may trigger a nuclear response because after all, though, I mean, France has more or less autonomous um, a nuclear strike force. Um, the uh, British is not so independent. It depends on the uh, on the decision of the U.S. But 
anyway, there is a possibility of uh, um, a nuclear response, meaning that the Russians had, at the same time they made this um, warning uh, to the French and the British, they had to have this exercise on the uh, order this uh, nuclear drill in order to make their promise credible. So meaning we are telling you that and we are preparing for anything you may respond towards this. So it's part of the um, the, the strategic game uh, or the, the deterrence game, if you want, between Russia and France and, um, and, and, and UK. Now, I mentioned before that NATO has this document that was uh, uh, mentioned in the Corriere della Sera, uh, which is an Italian paper. Uh, and, and there was this idea of this draft mentioning that NATO may not deploy troops in, uh, in Ukraine. Now we have to be very careful here since we mentioned this, I th these things that Macron and UK and um, and NATO. When NATO says NATO will not deploy troops or boots on the ground, it means that there will no there will be no boots on the ground under NATO command. That's important to because NATO has responsibility of troops under its command, if you want. But the troops that the French or Emmanuel Macron promised, in quotation mark, to Ukraine. These are not NATO troops. They are not under NATO command because the, the France and, and other countries, by the way, have signed bilateral agreements with Ukraine for, for providing military assistance and military support, including probably deployment of of uh, of military in uh, in 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 Ukraine. So, if let's say um, uh, France deploys uh, um, foreign legion or whatever French troops in Ukraine, this may not be a NATO commitment. It's a French commitment based on a bilateral agreement. So when the NATO says there will be no NATO troops on the ground, that means it will be no NATO under the responsibility of NATO. And NATO can only take responsibility of what is under its umbrella. But what France decides with its troops is outside of the umbrella. When France decides to deploy troops in the Sahel region, for instance, this has nothing to do with NATO. It's a French decision to use its its forces for national reasons and so on. NATO has nothing to say in that. So if France decides that its interest is in helping Ukraine, it may still uh, uh, send uh, uh, tr troops to, even if NATO has said there will be no NATO troops in Ukraine. I think it's very important because I, I when I see the different commentators uh, on the um, uh, on, in, in in the last couple of weeks, saying or in the last couple of days, sorry, uh, saying that oh well, that the uh, the decision of NATO then is a uh, is uh, is uh, is uh, a slap on on Macron and things like that. No, it's different. We're talking about different things. NATO troops is troops under NATO responsibility under NATO command. And, and remember, for instance, when you had in Afghanistan, you had NATO troops in Afghanistan, but especially at the beginning, in the early stage of the Western involvement, you had in fact two forces in, in Afghanistan. You had the ISAF, which was under the responsibility of NATO, and you had the, um, I, I think it was Enduring Freedom, the, um, the, the US operations, so U.S. is part of NATO, but the U.S. troops deployed in Afghanistan were not under NATO. It's important to understand. So you may have, <clears throat> you had U.S. troops in ISAF under NATO command on the one side, and you had U.S. forces under national command. 
And that, that even created problems because at one point they decide to have kind of a joint command and the command could only be American. As a result, you had an American command depending, I mean, directly under the president of the United States and NATO forces that were under US command. So the NATO was no longer under NATO, so to say. So this is this is the complexity of this uh, the, this this question. What is under NATO is must be understood as under NATO responsibility, but you may have national deployments that go besides the NATO, and that's what we may have in Ukraine. So the fact that NATO may preclude an involvement in its next summit in July or so uh, is one thing, but it doesn't preclude that you may not have French Foreign Legion units deployed in, in, uh, in Ukraine. I think it's very important to understand that. We're talking about diff different things here. So um, this, this means that uh, um, I think the since NATO doesn't want to commit troops, it may indicate to France that it's probably not a good idea to deploy uh, troops on its own. And that may have, if you want, a political impact on Macron's decision in, in, in a certain sense. But from a formal point of view, these are two different things. It are two different decisions but one may affect the other on, on a political sense, if you want. And uh, I think the, the, the fact that NATO precludes sending troops in, in Ukraine indicates that NATO has, in, in, the, in its mind, it thinks that the, the cause is lost in Ukraine. And in fact, what we are witnessing now is a progressive um, the, the U.S. is progressively abandoning Ukraine, in fact, because, uh, first of all, it's not good for the presidential election, especially for Biden. Um, so it's better not mentioning too much that. And I think there was also an article in Politico mentioning that Biden should not mention Ukraine anymore because it will resonate as a failure. As a result, Please don't mention that. But that may have other implications. And the US, what the US may have in mind now, especially uh, when we see the, uh, the, we look at the, uh, what may happen in the, the, the next NATO summit, is that the US may, in fact, give the, um, the whole package back to Europe and say, well, that's a European affair. Uh, you you were committed to that. Go ahead. That's your business. It's no longer ours because uh, we we don't want to to assume a, a failure uh, again. So that, that I think that's probably that's probably what we 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 are, we will see in in the coming months. Um, the the um, the peace conference in Switzerland. I mean, I don't have a crystal ball, but. The odds are not good for this uh, this conference. Uh, intuitively, uh, I would think that trying to make a peace conference without one of the parties of the conflict is already a lost cause. Uh, so I, I, I don't really understand the I, I, I really have a hard time to understand what's what's going in the mind of 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 my fellow uh, uh, citizens uh, in Switzerland because it's it's a total nonsense. But <clears throat> anyway, uh, we'll see that this conference may not be a success. It will exactly basically what we will have in June. Uh, in mid-June in Switzerland is a repetition of what we had just before the World Economic Forum in January uh, this year. Um, it will it will be just uh, the recognition of the so-called Zelensky plan, 
which is a plan that was elaborated by Zelensky last year, uh, asking for a capitulation of Russia. So I'm not sure it's very well connected to the reality on the ground. Um, and But it, it pleases the West, so probably Western countries will praise this uh, plan. But that's it. And uh, But I, I doubt it will have a concrete um, impact on the ground. As a result, the conference might be a failure. And we may have further failures on the ground. I mean, not just failures, but defeat on the ground in, uh, in the coming weeks, meaning that there is no reason for the US to drag this conflict in the presidential election and better to leave it to the successor of Biden, because I think nobody, I think, believes that Biden will be reelected on that. But again, I have no crystal ball and uh, uh, happen what will happen. In any case, um, I, I think nobody believes that it could be a success. And uh, even the most optimistic think that everything will end up in 2025. They just don't want to have ending before the election because it will be it will be the acknowledgement of a failure. While if it comes after the presidential election, that's something that will happen in the, nobody will talk about and uh, Ukraine will just uh, have its defeat in, in the shadow. And that's that's a little bit, I think, what is in the mind of our politicians. So that's uh, that's not so positive prospect for Ukraine. And uh, uh, we should have we, we would have better off. Uh, negotiating or accepting the terms uh, that um, Zelensky proposed to uh, to Russia, and that Russia was ready to accept in March last year, and uh, oh no, not uh, last year, sorry, two years ago, and um, that would have provided better condition for Ukraine. But now this is this is tempi passati as we say in italian and uh, this is uh, this is uh, this is past and uh, now we have to look for the future and the future is not so bright for ukraine i think but we'll see this new administration of putin and he, it seems that he's doing a lot of modifications within the administration shoigu is out and an economist is going to replace him how do you see these changes in this new administration of Putin? Well, I see that in a change in continuation, if you want, because, uh, in fact, Shoigu was, um, it has been for about 12 years, uh, defense minister. And during those two, 12 years, he managed to bring the Russian military to a level which he is which is unmatched, in fact. Uh, I can say unmatched because we can see with the uh, with what happens uh, uh, right now in um, in Ukraine that uh, the the West is not able to match the capabilities of of the Russians, both at the operational level and at industrial level. I think we have to to remember that the um, <clears throat> as opposed to what we see in the West. The in most countries in the West, the military industrial complex in Russia is still in large part state owned. And that's the reason why, by the way, it's so easy for Russia to increase production and things like this, because then when you start to uh, uh, step up production, for instance, for uh, artillery shells or missiles or whatever, you are not directly addressing the uh, the market conditions. Uh, that's that's the problem we have in in the, in the West, in Europe, in the United States to a certain extent. But after the 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 end of the Cold War, the Western uh, military industrial complex started to be uh, privatized. As a result, now they produce according to the market law. I mean, it must be a, a demand and the supply will match the demand. If there is no demand, then there is no supply. 
this is the that you you don't have exactly that in a state owned type of of uh, of industry because then you the industry produces not based on the rule of the market but based on the national interest which may differ to some extent that's why it's very difficult for instance in france we see they wanted to ramp up the production of artillery shell and even in europe because as you remember the prime minister of czechia uh, had this initiative to produce or provide ukraine with one million shells and nobody was able to produce that why because Although Western or European countries do have companies that produce artillery shells, the, the investment required to create new production lines and so on, this, uh, uh, this investment must be staged in, 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 a, in, a, in a longer term view. You cannot just <clears throat> spend millions to increase your production just for a few weeks or months. It has to be uh, uh, scheduled and projected in the future. Well, on, on the Russian side, this is not the case. And that's the strengths of the uh, Russian military industrial complex because it, it responds to the national interest. And that's, in fact, everything we have seen in, a, in, the, in the last two years in terms of increasing the capacities uh, of the, 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 the Russian military is in fact the result of Shoigu's work. And it's probably not a coincidence if now we have an economist that takes over uh, for this, this kind, because the challenges ahead are in fact economical challenge, uh, or economic challenge. And that's that's probably the reason why uh, um, Barusov, uh, Barulov, I think, uh, or I don't remember his name now, uh, was selected to uh, succeed to Shoigu. But it's interesting to see that as opposed to what we have seen in the West, that um, uh, uh, Shoigu was uh, was not very satisfactory and so on and and then was demoted and things like that. We don't see that at all. In fact, um, Shoigu will be the secretary of the uh, National Security Council, which is uh, probably the, the, the highest decision body in the Russian system. As a result, um, Shoigu was to some extent promoted in uh, in uh, having this this job, taking over from uh, Mr. Patrushov, who used to be uh, also this in this position in the last couple of years. So, I think uh, what we have seen, and of course, uh, um, Vladimir Putin was re-elected, so it's normal that you have a reshuffle in the. Um, in the in the higher position of the of the ministry ministries, and in fact you don't have so many changes, showing that in fact you have uh, the, the 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 current organization and current structure works uh, at satisfaction, and there is no need to have radical changes. So it shows a, a, a stability, in fact, in the system. It shows that the system works. It shows that the system will, will be probably improved in the future because there are certainly a lot of challenges ahead. Um, and, and certainly the, uh, the economic challenge is, is probably one of the, the biggest. I mean, Russian economy works well so far. It has, in fact, benefited from the sanctions in the sense that the sanctions have pushed Russia to make changes that would not have been necessary otherwise, because uh, Russia was relying on the uh, international market for a lot of goods, uh, including the Western market, of course, the Western market. And um, by imposing sanctions, it, it made Russia more, let's say, conscious of, of the need of having oh, their own 
uh, production cap capacities and to expand uh, relationships with reliable allies like China and probably India and probably others. And that's that's the um, uh, because the, the natural, let's say, the Russians tend to look westwards. And, and that's normal because they belong to Europe. I mean, in, uh, if you look at the, the continental uh, setting, <laughs> that's the way it is. I mean, the, this is uh, Russia is a European um, nation and a European country, but it's also a Eurasian country. It's important to to see that, and the uh, the sanctions have in fact pushed Russia to focus on the Eurasian dimension rather than the European. And that's uh, something that is, uh, it's a very long debate in the Russian history. Even Dostoevsky uh, in, in his books uh, mentions this debate between uh, um, the Russia looking westwards or eastwards. And uh, at the time when China was developing I mean, the, the, during the Cold War era and, and probably up to the early uh, 2000s, um, China was developing and it was natural for Russia to look westwards. But today we see that China is, as uh, I think Viktor Orban said, as uh, Xi Jinping visited his country a couple of days ago, um, Viktor Orban said that today China is leading the world. The world, and it's it's not leading in the same way the U.S. used to lead the world. That's for sure. But it's leading anyway uh, in terms of research and development, in terms of technological development, in terms of the I would say even in in brain production to some extent, because. If you look at the number of engineers that are uh, um, coming out of the Chinese schools, it outmatches absolutely all the, the, the rest of the world, in fact. And even the Taiwanese uh, go to um, engineer schools and high and institutes in mainland China. So meaning that China de facto is, in fact, is is leading the world, and it's the it's the country that produces or it registers the most patent uh, every every year. It's uh, we we see, and that's that's in fact the the uh, the panic of the West reflects that change in the world order. That uh, that's that's probably no coincidence that uh, Janet Yellen, uh, Yellen and uh, Anthony Blinken uh, and um, Olaf Scholz or Emmanuel Macron uh, keep asking uh, Xi Jinping to uh, uh, step down the, the 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 industrial production in China and so on and so forth because of course they 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 cannot match with China. And even if they wanted Matt, to, to 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 compete with China, they would it would be totally impossible because the um, with a market of uh, roughly one and a half billion uh, consumers, um, China can produce at 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 much higher uh, uh, quantities, much higher quantities at much lower price because they have a scaling effect that that makes the the price of of production much lower. As a result, um, there is there is no point trying to compete with China, and <clears throat> the the future of the coexistence because China is is there. I mean, we we cannot. Uh, make as if it wasn't there. It is there. And the the problem of the West, the West is trying to fight the problem. While the Russians have understood that you cannot compete with China, then worked with it. This is also, I think, a model of what the, the West should do. If you If you cannot compete with your adversary, try to work with him. That's the best way to uh, to have a win-win solution. 
And the U.S. has not understood that, at least uh, in the well, I I don't know I don't like this expression, but the neocons, if you want, have not understood that. There is still a sense that the West must dominate the world. Um, remember the what uh, Boris Johnson said just uh, one month ago or so. He used to say, if Ukraine falls, then the, we, the, uh, the, the West will lose its hegemony and use the word, the word hegemony, meaning that this is a strong sense in the uh, Western leadership, even European leadership, that it should be an hegemony of the West. And that's exactly the kind of thing which, in my view, is totally misguided when we start to compete with China and later India. It's much better to work with them, to, to, to be good uh, partners, in fact, and to develop things in partnership. And that's, in fa that's interesting because I remember in the early 2000s, end of the 90s, as you had, I mean, even even before that, I mean, I should say that was even before, but um, in the late 90s, as people were trying to advertise globalization and so on, they said, well, that should be a win-win situation because globalization should be, in fact, a partnership with others and everybody can use its comparative advantage and in order to make the world uh, 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 go higher and 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 further further further, but it it didn't turn that way. The West tried to use globalization as a tool for hegemony rather than a tool for a partnership. And it's interesting. I mean, the 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 orientation of Russia towards a Eurasian continent may in fact to some extent lead the way because the the Europe will have to do that. There is no there is in, in the current if you look, we look at the current situation, there is no prospect for the for Europe to compete with China. So we have to work with them. We have to work with the realities. The problem is that the Western leadership is uh, work with narratives and no with uh, and not with with um, with the reality and uh, this is probably the qualitative uh, change that the ukraine war but not only the ukrainian war by the way uh, because we see the same a similar uh, um, evolution in the middle east and we see that uh, the rapprochement we have seen between Saudi Arabia and Iran, for instance, indicates that there is also the same type of understanding. And, and we could also add the rapprochement, not rapprochement, but let's say the increased relation, economic relationship between um, the, um, the, the Middle East countries, including Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia, with China, because Everybody understands that China is the, the as as we can see it from today, China is the future. And as a result, we need to understand that and we need to cooperate rather than than to antagonize uh, uh, China. So you, we have a parallel understanding in the global south or the global the rest of the world as you want to to call it but we see that there's a sense that the um the west used to lead the way in the post-war post-second world war times certainly in the in the 60s the 50s 60s 70s but today the west is no longer a model uh both socially economically in a societal range and in in many in many uh, um, aspect as a result and you have a challenger for that you have an alternative and that's asia and uh, that's why we have this trend so russia has understood that and now we have that in the middle east so we, it it indicates i think the, the changes in the russian uh, establishment 
do not indicate uh, major changes in the terms of of uh, a radical change or revolution, if you want. We are we have ra rather an evolutionary situation, but in the in the sense that this evolution that was guided or provoked by the sanctions go in the direction of the of the probably a new century uh, where Asia will be leading the way in the in the world. That, that's that's how I see it. I I might be wrong, but I think for the foreseeable future, that's that's the uh, that's the way, and uh, I think everybody understands that. So the and and even I mean we I I, I briefly mentioned the the trip of uh, Xi Jinping in Europe. We have seen that the purpose of the, the visit of Xi Jinping was, in fact, to visit Serbia and, uh, and, and Hungary. And France was just there to just to keep the Europeans quiet, because if China would have been only to Serbia and, and uh, Hungary, uh, I think the Europeans would have considered that as a kind of... Um, provocation somehow because uh, these are the two mavericks in um, in the European on the European continent uh, if you want and um, so Xi Jinping paid a visit to France but we have seen that this visit was not very fruitful and in fact didn't didn't bring any tangible result while on the uh, for Serbia and for uh, Hungary, these were very tangible results. So we see that the the Chinese were very subtle in their approach to keep the the European quiet by visiting France. But this was just a side a sideshow, if you want, to in order to have with the main partners people who are ready to work with uh with China for the um the belt and road initiative and countries that have also understood that the European Union has some limits and they have acknowledged these limits i mean hungary is of course very vocal in the uh, european union and we see that on each uh, uh, european summit um <clears throat> and my personal view is that the European leadership, I mean, the, the head of the uh, the European Commission, uh, uh, Frau, <laughs> that's a German word for Madame <laughs> Ursula von der Leyen, um, they should be more, I think they should pay more attention to what uh, Viktor Orban says, because um, I think Hungary has understood that the the European Union has provided probably some benefits, uh, but it has also several and severe drawbacks that may <clears throat> affect the European economy in the future. And it's probably good uh, to have a less antagonistic posture as regards Asia than uh, Ursula von der Leyen. The problem is that uh, the leadership in Europe is very, very supportive to U.S., very close to um, the, I mean, even, even I would say institutionally close to, um, to NATO. Uh, as a result, you have this idea that there is still uh, this hegemony, the sense of hegemony of the West remains very strong in the European leadership, especially in the European Union leadership. And I think that is not a, a, a guarantee for a good future, in my view. But um, so I think that is no coincidence that Xi Jinping visited uh, Serbia, certainly, because that was also the... Um, uh, the 25th uh, anniversary of the bombing of the, the embassy there in Belgrade, but also um, uh, uh, Hungary. And um, we should probably look better, pay more attention to these uh, signals. 